Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to um, our seminar series from the Center for the Study of Europe at the Boston University Pardee School of Global Studies on Europe in the World, a EU Jean Monnet sponsored speaker series. I am Professor Kaya Schilde. I am the EU Jean Monnet Chair of European Security and Defense from 2022 to 2024. And um, I have been convening a number of uh, uh, in-person and uh, Zoom and hybrid conversations about the EU's role in the world, its role as an actor, um, both historically and in a contemporary sense, and having that discussion with a number of wonderful interdisciplinary scholars. Today, I am delighted to introduce uh, all of us to uh, Professor Stephen Gross. He is an Associate Professor of History and the Director of the Center for European and Mediterranean Studies at NYU. And he today is going to be talking and discussing his recent book called Energy and Power, Germany in the Age of Oil, Atoms, and Climate Change. So welcome, Professor Gross. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth and Kaya, for organizing this. It's really a, a pleasure to be here uh, or be uh, virtually here uh, and to, to, to talk with you all. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Um, yeah, so this is uh, a talk about my new book that just came out uh, at the beginning of the summer about Germany and energy policy, really. Uh, I first got into German energy policy when I was actually in Berlin doing research for my dissertation in 2008 and 2009 when natural gas was shut off because of, of a dispute, a natural gas dispute between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and I realized, you know, then just how politicized energy was as an issue in German culture. Um and there had been a lot of good books written about particular energies, but not one that had kind of put all of the energies together into one, um, one uh, you know, kind of comprehensive uh, story. And so that's what I hope to do. Uh, and this past year uh, or two, of course, have has underscored just how even more politicized energy has become since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. You know, obviously, we know that there is an energy crisis in Europe uh, associated with natural gas. Um, the year 2022 was also a year of intense climate drought in Europe uh, that uh, kind of reminded people or brought it home to Europeans that uh, the climate catastrophe that people had been reading about was here on the doorstep. Um, and so it seems, you know, it seems in the past few years that geopolitics, economics, and global warming has been interacting to an, an unprecedented extent. Uh, and and so I'm I'm a historian. Um, I only really touch on kind of the, the years after 2000 in the coda of my book. Uh, and in some sense, writing the book was like uh, trying to hit a moving target uh, in, in the German energy policy was changing very dramatically uh, as I was finishing the book. Um, and really the focal point of, of my book, what I'm trying to understand are these kind of crucial years in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, which I see as a kind of a historical paradox. And the paradox is that uh, there was great knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, and even political knowledge that climate change was happening. You know, we have the International Panel on Climate Change being formed, uh, the Rio Earth Conference, Kyoto Accords, uh, you know, people arguing climate change is happening and it's real. And yet, on the other hand, you have uh, profound political inaction on climate change. Uh, and so this is, you know, something that that is something of a historical paradox or, or a problem to understand why the inaction. But in some respects, Germany was a country that actually was trying to do something to change its energy system during these years uh, uh, under a red-green uh, novel left coalition around 2000, the nation embarked on a pioneering energy transition to rebuild its economy on energy efficiency and on renewables. Um, they passed a series of groundbreaking laws that turned Germany for a while uh, into the world's largest market for solar and wind power. Uh, and this has come to be known as uh, the energy vendor or the energy transition. Um, but the energy vendor uh, uh, or the energy transition has run into many problems. Uh, you know, the wind doesn't always blow. The sun doesn't always shine. And in many ways, um, uh, people argue that this kind of push, this rapid push into renewables, which was precocious at the time, has made it in some ways harder to move off of coal and to move off of natural gas. And it's remarkable how polarizing this issue has become in Germany and really in all of Europe. Um, some praised uh, the Energy Vende as, quote, one of the greatest social experiments in German history, end quote, or as uh, the Federal Republic's, quote, gift to the world. Others excoriate it as a crime against future generations or a lunatic gamble that is going to deindustrialize the nation. So, you know, th these are really kind of, in you know, there's really intense rhetoric around this. Um, 
and so how historically did energy become such a charged affair in Germany uh, and in Europe? How did it become how did energy become entangled with so many different uh, other aspects of policymaking, uh, including European integration? Um, and why did Germany uh, embark on a risky policy of trying to build a more carbon free energy system at the turn of the millennium? And so these are some of the questions that my book, Energy and Power, uh, is trying uh, uh, to ask. And, you know, as a historian, I, I have I try and pose basically three different types of questions or, 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 or there are kind of three different premises of the book. Um, and the first is that, you know, looking at German history after 1945 really has a lot to teach us about how and why energy transitions happen. That Germany, since 1945, passed through five different energy transitions, uh, the rise of oil, the rise of nuclear power, a turn towards energy efficiency, uh, the rise of natural gas, and then the rise of renewables. Uh, and that exploring why these transitions happened in Germany can help us understand the nature of energy transitions in general. Um, uh, the second uh, premise is that energy is really entangled in many other processes of uh, German and European history, and that exploring energy as a subject can help us kind of shine new light or understand kind of conventional processes in new and interesting ways. Uh, the economic miracle, for example, in the 1950s and 1960s looks very different if you look at it from the standpoint of coal and oil, uh, or even the process of European integration. New frictions come in uh, to view when you look at it from the standpoint of energy. Um, and, and the third story that I try and tell is, is, uh, uh, this, is about this intense politicization of, of energy in the Federal Republic. This begins very early, this politicization, uh, and it uh, is really kind of gives us a new view about why the energy venda happened around uh, 2000, that there's a, a very much a standard narrative or a standard explanation about why Germany, you know, adopted these groundbreaking policies. And uh, people, you know, historians as well as social scientists really focus on the rise of the green movement and say it was really political outsiders, activists, dissidents, protesters, who really kind of pushed Germany in a new direction. Um, but this, in some ways, uh, recreates a triumphalist narrative um, uh, and misreads the nature of energy transitions, I argue. And so I you know, try and show how Germany's energy changes came very much from political insiders as much as from political outsiders, uh, mainstream energy experts, social democrats, key union leaders and key business sectors are all part of this story. Um, and energy, I argue, is unusually politicized in Germany well before the 1970s. So that, that's the decade, you know, in America that's often taken to be the moment when energy becomes a theme with uh, the oil shocks of 73 and 79. And this is when energy becomes politicized. Uh, but in Germany, this began much, much earlier. Um, and, and I argue that we need to kind of look at a range of different actors and viewpoints to understand uh, why transitions happen. Um, and here I, I actually juxtapose myself against uh, the view or the, kind of the, the way economists and economic historians approach energy history, that for a long time, the study of transitions was, was dominated by, by economists who, you know, who, who basically in crude form say, you know, as the price of an energy falls, as technology improves, new energies replace old energies. But this is in some ways too simplistic. Um, and I draw uh, from the ideas of Hermann Scheer, uh, pictured here uh, on, on the left, um, who was uh, a social democrat reformer who was pivotal in launching the, the energy venda uh, uh, in the Red-Green Coalition. Uh, and, and he argues that energy transitions are political battles, uh, that they're, they're battles with clear winners and clear losers, and battles that play out in the realm of politics as much as they play out in the realm of economics. Um, and that to understand why one energy succeeds and another energy fails, we have to look at a variety of different things. And so I, I in my book, look at markets like economists do, but I also look at states and parties, and I also look at social groups. Um, and I, I also look at how energy is mobilized in different ways, that I look at how uh, actors link energy to other issues like exports or security or democracy. Uh, I talk about how coalitions, political coalitions are built around energy questions. Um, I, I explore how different coalitions then kind of craft visions of the future about what their energetic future would look like and how that mobilizes people. And I also talk about how they exploit crises to advance, kind of break older ways of thinking and advance newer ways of thinking. 
so what I want to do uh, is to give a couple examples uh, from the book, uh, kind of concrete examples uh, that, that illustrates this approach. And it talks about the history of Germany since 1945. Um, and I'll begin by starting with, with the concept of a rupture. This is something historians talk about. From the standpoint of cl classic or conventional political history, uh, 1945 marks really the biggest rupture in European and specifically German history with uh, uh, total war led to the total defeat of Nazi Germany and the occupation of much of Europe and Germany by uh, American and Soviet troops. Um, but in many ways, from the standpoint of energy, the greater rupture in German history and even in much of European history is in the 1950s and the 1960s. And this is when Germany becomes an oil nation or becomes a, a, a nation that runs much more on oil than it used to be. Um, across the Atlantic, uh, America had made this turn earlier. It had become really what people call a high energy society where, uh, uh, you know, Consumers became used to using prodigious amounts of energy already in the 1920s and the 1930s. In Europe and Germany, this really didn't happen until the 1950s and the 1960s. Uh, in 1950, German farms mostly still ran on muscle power. Uh, household energy appliances were a luxury, for example. In the 1950s, uh, Germany's per capita energy consumption was about the same as it was in 1913. Um, so, it, you know, it had hardly changed. It had ebbed and flowed with the world wars. Um, and like its imperial and its fascist predecessors, the Federal Republic uh, was grounded in coal, uh, specifically hard coal, as uh, the energy foundation of its of its economy. But in, in, in the 1950s and 60s, this changed dramatically. Uh, and that there's uh, what what I call this massive wave of oil that inundates the nation. And, you, you know, you can see it pictured here in gray, how oil explodes. In fact, this is one of the most dramatic energy transitions that any nation has ever experienced, or at least any uh, uh, industrial nation in the span of about 20 years. Oil explodes to become the dominant energy source of, of the nation. And this would really shape a lot of uh, German history. Um, this is because oil threatened directly the hard coal sector uh, that was found beneath the surface of the Ruhr, which is the industrial heartland of, of Germany. Out of a population of about 5 million people in the Ruhr, no less than half a million people in this region were directly employed in the mines, plus many others who were kind of employed in tertiary sectors related to mining. Um, and, you know, we, we often hear uh, that Europe adopted oil or that people adopted oil because it was somehow an inherently better fuel or, or inherently cheaper. Uh, but in fact, the rise of oil that put coal under pressure was very much uh, the result of a conscious political strategy that was adopted by American leaders and also by Ludwig Erhard, the economics minister, to make oil a pillar of the German economy. Uh, you know, America established its security umbrella in the Middle East. Uh, it had like these in amazing tax write-offs for oil exploration. The U.S. Marshall Plan gave lots of funding uh, to build refineries. Uh, meanwhile, the economics ministry in Germany gave its own tax rebates, low interest rate loans, and subsidies to build refineries and pipelines. Um, Ludwig Erhard in particular, uh, and many of his experts, uh, also thought that the old coal cartels that really ran the coal industry were deeply connected with Nazi Germany. And part of their kind of the way that they understood the rise of the Nazis was that, you know, business cartels, among them coal, helped propel the Nazis uh, uh, into power. And so Ludwig Erhard, as, as well as the Americans, really wanted to smash up and break the power of the coal cartels. And they wanted to do this by bringing oil uh, 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 into the country and by making oil uh, as as cheap as possible. So this first post-war energy transition um, uh, triggered three crises. Um, oops, sorry, this is more images from the oil wave. Uh, surprising is an anecdote how many uh, energy-related board games there are in German culture. Here's, here's one. I've played other ones that were designed in the 2000s that are about electricity. There's probably a whole cultural history to be written about energy board games. Um, so the, the first of these energy transitions was in 1956, or the, the, these energy crises was in 1956, uh, the Suez Canal crisis, when Nasser, uh, uh, the new Egyptian leader, responded to Britain and, and, and France's invasion of Egypt uh, by blocking the Suez Canal. 
uh, and blowing up pipelines that connected uh, the new source of oil in the Middle East, which is where Europe got the bulk of its oil, uh, by blowing these pipelines up and by blocking the Suez Canal. And, and this created a massive energy scare. All of a sudden, German leaders realized that this new energetic foundation of their nation was now outside of their control, uh, that oil lay beyond uh, kind of the power of the German state to do anything about, uh, because it all came from the Middle East. Um, a second energy crisis then erupted shortly thereafter in 1958 uh, and in 1959. And this was uh, when actually there was too much energy, uh, uh, where two warm winters and a mild recession uh, and kind of over predictions about coal use led to actually, you know, an, an overproduction of coal, uh, really a massive overproduction. And you see these kind of uh, coal piles piling up, uh, you know, at the pithead. Um, it, this led mining companies to lay off, you know, tens of thousands of people, and over the next three years, over a hundred thousand miners would lose their job, and 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 this threatened major social unrest that kind of uh, uh, gripped the nation's policymakers, uh, and it sparked some of the largest protests uh, in German history before the 1970s, with 80,000 people marching in Bochum. Uh, which is a mining town, also in Bonn, uh, the, the the political capital. Uh, a third energy crisis, oh, and, and people had tended to blame Ludwig Erhard, the miners tended to blame Ludwig Erhard, and there are any number of kind of political cartoons attesting to this. Um, uh, uh, and then a third energy crisis erupted again in 1966, which is another crisis of coal overproduction where uh, more miners were laid off. Um, uh, this is again spurred by falling oil prices uh, and, and, and an economic slowdown. And so this led to massive capital flight as companies that had uh, shares in mining companies, you know, took their shares out, tried to sell the mines to get out of the Ruhr to find a place to invest their, their um, you know, their money. Uh, in, in the language of today, this is very much like there are a lot of underwater assets. We hear that that term today in the case of oil companies potentially having underwater assets if, if oil is no longer used. That, that was happening in, in Germany in the 1960s. And this led to a staggering number of people facing unemployment. Now, a quick word about how Europe enters into the picture uh, in European integration here, that the European coal and steel community uh, was, you know, as you know, the first institution of European integration. It established the high authority uh, led by Jean Monnet. Uh, and the idea of this institution was in part to overcome the legacy of World War II, uh, to put these industrial and war making uh, industries, coal on the one hand, steel on the other, under joint or transnational control. But another goal was to preserve French access to West German energy at a time when the German economy was rebuilding and might need that energy for its own. Uh, and that Monet thought that to ensure French growth, he needed access to cheap German coal. Um, but in 1956, or I'm sorry, 1958, the, the, the ECSC was utterly ineffective in handling this first coal crisis. Uh, it you know, delayed declaring a state of crisis that would have exercised or allowed it to exercise certain emergency powers. Then after a year, it finally declared crisis a uh, situation would, which would have led it to, to kind of pool coal resources and, uh, and enact tariffs. But then the member states, above all, Italy rejected this and said, look, the Northern European states like Germany haven't really helped this out in an energetic sense before. And we don't want to participate in some type of joint uh, uh, oversight of coal. Um, uh, even West Germany rejected this uh, effort by the ECSC to solve the crisis because it, it had just gotten control back over its coal sector and was very reluctant to hand you know, that control back to the high authority uh, uh, to resolve the crisis. Um, again, in 1966, the ECSC did very little. Uh, at one point, the high authority proposed a joint European-wide energy policy as a way to balance competing needs that, that it, you know, we, we need cheap energy for growth on the one hand, but, you know, we want to make sure people don't lose jobs. Um, uh, and again, the member states largely rejected such a such comprehensive powers. Um, uh, and so, you know, th this is an example of, of this first institution of the EU really failing to develop a common energy policy. And, and this is something that plagues European uh, uh, a community in European Union politics for a long time. Uh, and so really it was national policies that brought the Federal Republic and other European, Western Euro European states through this first coal crisis. You know, the, the Federal Republic enacted a series of subsidies for the coal industry. Um, uh, it actually, you know, uh, bought uh, all of the coal uh, mines or many of them in the, in, in the Ruhr and kind of forcibly put them into one big organization, Ruhr Coal AG. Uh, and spent a lot of public money 
to shut down mines and to pay uh, the former mine owners to, to to get out and to extract themselves from the coal sector. Uh, and so critics called this the, the mining death club. Uh, but here, th this is a state orchestrated transition to kind of pay uh, public money to help the losing energy survive without a lot of social dislocation. Um, and these debates politicized energy. Uh, this led to, these crises led to the first formal parliamentary inquiry into energy in Germany in 1960. And this began a routine of kind of bringing different stakeholders in energy to make energy decisions. Uh, key figures, including Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, thought energy was now too important to be entirely left to the market. Um, and energy began to be linked to other issues at this point already in 1960, issues of social security, but also issues or social stability and also issues of geopolitical security. And it was a labor leader, uh, Heinrich Gutermuth, uh, who said, look, we need to pay attention to energy security. He begins using this concept already in the 1960s and says uh, the Federal Republic pays a premium for military security. We also need to pay a premium for energy security. Um, and th this this is in, in contrast to America, where energy security and energy dependence doesn't really become a thing at all until the 1970s. Um, so if, if the 1950s and 60s saw energy become politicized uh, in uh, West Germany, then really the events of the 1970s and the 1980s really created the conditions for West Germans to change their approach to energy. Uh, and while the spark came from grassroots movements, uh, uh, the course of this transition or the shift was profoundly shaped by a conventional and, and mainstream politicians and experts. Um, energy as a subject, uh, again, became politicized in 1972 and 1973, one with the Club of Rome, uh, its report on the limits to growth that talked about, you know, the fear of, of resource scarcity. Uh, and then it became further politicized with the oil shock of 1973, where OPEC uh, dramatically raised the price of oil. Um, one response to this OPEC oil shock was a campaign to expand nuclear power, not only in Germany, but across much of Europe, France as well. Um, and this led to a huge social backlash, uh, which many people have written about. There's this kind of extensive uh, 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 literature on the German anti-nuclear movement. Um, and this movement reached a climax, a first climax in 1976 and 1977, when protests spiraled out of control and there were violent confrontations around, oh, there's a siren, sorry. It's the wonders of giving a talk or the beauties of giving a talk in New York City. You never know what you're gonna hear out your window. Um, uh, then and and this this led to the largest uh, deployment of police in the history of the Federal Republic. And so you see some of these images here that these kind of gripped the public um, uh, and uh, led to the formation of, of, of a highly eclectic social movement that uh, crystallized around the question of nuclear power and it included young activists, educated professionals, uh, people on the far left who were coming from the 68 revolution. Uh, yeah, even conservatives and farmers. So there's really diverse anti-nuclear movement. Um, uh, and, you know, my, my, my book kind of partly tells this story, but, but it also kind of shifts the, the, the perspective and talks about specifically how this anti-nuclear movement linked nuclear power to other issues and also how it stimulated the mainstream political parties to, to rethink their approach to energy. Um, and the first point is that the anti-nuclear movement um, successfully linked the question of nuclear power to a fear of a resurgence of political authoritarianism. Uh, and, and they linked nuclear power to the Third Reich of all things. Uh, you know, so there's this one big question today in kind of contemporary EU politics is why France is going into nuclear power and Germany has decided to shut down all of its reactors. And there's there's a lot of causes. It's kind of a hard thing to explain. It's partly about deeper roots of the ecological movement. Um, but one thing that I found particularly convincing is this ability of, of, of proto-green leaders in the 70s and the 80s to link nuclear power to the Third Reich, uh, that there was a deep-rooted anxiety among the anti-nuclear movement that ecological collapse would happen if the world did not stop pursuing like infinite economic growth, that growth, limitless economic growth was a bad thing, uh, and that this limitless economic growth required uh, immense amounts of energy and that providing immense amount of energy required very complex technology uh, and that this complex technology 
was becoming so complicated uh, that it could only that it cannot be overseen by a weak state. That only strong states uh, and very powerful and authoritarian states would be able to oversee this type of technology. Um, again, this is kind of a hyperbolic claim, um, but it's something that you see made by the anti-nuclear movement, in particular by uh, Robert Jung, uh, who coins the the, the expression the expression der Atomstadt or uh, the atomic state in in uh, English. His book gets translated into a new tyranny, how nuclear power enslaves us all. Uh, and and this lays out this this logic that uh, the atomic state was creating surveillance and centralization that was reminiscent of authoritarian regimes uh, and that was a threat to German democracy. Uh, and again, this is something that was hyperbolic, but it resonated with Germans because at this very moment they're going through their own kind of deep process of 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 uh, of memory culture that deals with the Third Reich and the legacy of the Nazis. Uh, uh, the Holocaust miniseries, for example, airs in 1978 and 1979 and you know in West Germany. And this is kind of at the same time that uh, Junk is making these claims that nuclear power requires you know, state power, the likes of which we haven't seen since the 1930s and the 1940s. Um, so the anti-nuclear movement and, and others actually looked to America uh, for a new set of ideas. And they were inspired by Amory Lovins who coined this term. He's, he's an American um, ecologist uh, who would found the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, he coins the term, the soft energy path uh, in 1976. And he says, look, there's kind of two energy types of energy systems. We can have kind of centralized supply oriented energy that relies on complicated technology or we can have an alternative, uh, a soft path that's small scale technology, decentralized, flexible, sustainable, diverse, uh, and it could be governed in a more local and democratic fashion. Um, and the anti-nuclear movement, you know, adopts these ideas wholesale. Um, and they argue that we need a new type of energy, uh, not really for environmental reasons, but for reasons of democracy to support our, our, our fledgling democracy. Um, uh, now, crucially, one of the parties, so it, 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 it wasn't only the anti-nuclear movement that was adopting these policies, that uh, one of the pol parties that did a lot to promote these new ideas was the reform wing of the Social Democrats, uh, that they helped take these new ideas about a soft energy path mainstream. Uh, and they linked this idea of a soft energy path to more traditional concerns like exports and like jobs. Uh, and that they... Uh, you know, the Social Democrats began to adopt these ideas in part because they feared the Green Party was was uh, or the anti-nuclear movement was going to form into a party and take votes away. Uh, and so they, uh, Willy Brandt in particular and Erhard Epler pictured here, thought the Social Democrats would have to become green themselves, in a sense, to respond to the threat of the anti-nuclear movement. Um, uh, and here they were led by Erhard Epler, who is a Protestant reformer. Um, there he is with Helmut Schmidt, who kind of is uh, uh, encapsulates the 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 right wing of the Social Democrat Party. Epler is kind of on the left wing. Um, so under Epler's lead, uh, Germany began to pivot on energy in the 1970s, and he argued that the Social Democrats should promote technology and policy that could save energy and create new jobs at the same time, uh, and and. Uh, protect the environment and protect democracy. Um, and here he was supported by uh, a new set of experts uh, who call themselves uh, or follow a doctrine of ecological modernization. And, and, and they began to rethink the relationship between energy and growth. And, and they say, well, look, um, you don't need more energy to grow and that we can achieve growth without achieving ever more energy use, uh, that energy savings could be a new energy source, you know, if we promote this with the state. Um, and above all, they wanted to have a political price for energy, that they wanted uh, the state to make the price of energy high in general uh, so that people would use less of it and so that companies would have to innovate to find new ways to produce stuff without using energy. And they wanted a, a, a price policy that would kind of channel profits away from fossil fuels and nuclear power and towards uh, greener energies or towards energy efficiency technologies. Um, uh, and so this is a political price of energy that they wanted. Um, a key player here uh, was Volker Hauf, who actually in the early 1980s rolled out an idea for a, for a really like powerful economic or, or, or eco tax and to kind of 
revised uh, the German fiscal system along an ecological uh, uh, axis. Um, and he also began to link energy to other ideas. And he said, look, these, uh, you know, green energy and energy efficiency, these will create jobs at home, installing, you know, uh, solar panels, uh, installing heating insulation. This is going to create a lot of local jobs. Uh, and this is going to help us through our economic hardship. This is also a time of rising unemployment. He also linked green energy to exports. And he said that these are going to be the new big export sectors of the world. And we should get in on this. Um, the SPD couldn't enact all of these policies before they fell from power, but they did. Uh, did I? There we go. They they did um, enact uh, some policies around energy saving, and in fact, 1979 was really the moment when Germany began to diverge from other Western European countries and from America in its energy footprint. That its energy use per GDP unit has declined ever since, where in other countries it hasn't. And so this is a you know type of divergence. Um, now now here again. I want to pivot back and and look at uh, say say a couple words about European integration. Um, in the 1970s, energy again became an important policy field, where European leaders uh, thought they could integrate Europe more deeply to to overcome uh, the oil shock of 1973. Willy um, Brandt, SPD Chancellor of Germany, when the oil shock struck, you know, he himself thought that more and deeper European integration would be one potential solution to the problem. Um, and on the eve of the oil crisis and kind of throughout the crisis, Brussels uh, tried to create a comprehensive energy strategy for the European community. Uh, they recommended that member states harmonize their, their oil taxes and their energy taxes, that they coordinate state intervention, they start doing joint, you know, hydrocarbon exploration. Um, but again, these efforts foundered on the national interests of the member states, that Britain, which had just entered the EC uh, in 73, and Belgium, they actually stopped exporting refined oil products in 1973 to keep those at home for themselves. France and Britain uh, spurned any effort of, of having a unilateral declaration of support for the one European country that suffered an oil embargo, which was the Netherlands. Uh, there was a big debate about this. Uh, and instead, they um, struck bilateral deals with Middle Eastern oil exporting countries like Saudi Arabia and Iraq. Um, and then most importantly, and this is something we saw again just a year ago, that these wildly diverging pricing policies within Europe, uh, with how member states dealt with the price of an energy, prevented any type of coherent uh, energy policy from emerging. That France and Britain actually regulated very closely the price of oil, uh, the cost of, 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 of imported oil. And Germany, by contrast, had a very liberal energy price system, uh, you know, at the time, and and that both sides, you know, refused to compromise. So there was, again, um, uh, an inability to have a collective European energy policy in the 1970s. So again, through the 1970s, European states largely charted uh, national courses through the energy shocks of 1973 uh, and 1979. Um, uh, and, you know, just, you know, I just want to re sorry, reiterate that th this point that all of these ideas like of, of Volker Half and Epler and, and the anti-nuclear movement for uh, pushing a new energy transitions, that these are not emerging in the context of climate change, that these are ideas that are responding to other problems about democracy, about local environmental pollution, about energy security, that climate change really only comes on the scene later in the 1980s and the 1990s. So Global warming is kind of layered on top of other reasons for having an energy transition. Um, now, when the Social Democrats and the Greens come back to power or come come together uh, and 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 they come to power in 1998 in Germany, they they would implement many of the ideas that were uh, first kind of thought about and 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 flushed out in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, and and they passed their groundbreaking energy legislation by linking energy again to a lot of different issues. They linked energy reform to jobs. Uh, in the late 1990s, Germany was called the sick man of Europe because reunification was costing so such, such an immense amount of money. Uh, and Germany had a very high unemployment rate. And so they saw green energy to be a jobs engine. They linked energy to exports. Uh, they thought that wind and solar would be big export markets. Uh, they linked green energy to energy security. Uh, the 1990s again saw kind of fears about hydrocarbon insecurity resurface again. This is uh, a period of very volatile energy markets as China was, you know, entering the WTO 
industrializing and growing and sucking oil into itself. Uh, and, and that caused the price of oil to rise dramatically. Uh, this kind of coincided with predictions of peak energy or, or sorry, peak oil production that came hard and fast during the late 1990s and kind of new books like this one by Hans Kronberg about uh, the deleterious effects of oil. So th this, this kind of revives uh, anxieties about energy security uh, and, and fears about where the oil would come from. Um, uh, and so these policy linkages helped kind of sell uh, this package of energy reform to the German public. Uh, uh, the Red Green Coalition passed an eco tax. It was watered down, but it nevertheless kind of raised the price of energy. It passed the renewable energy law uh, in 1999 and went into effect in 2000 that set a political price for energy for wind and solar that basically guaranteed quite substantial profits uh, for wind and solar producers. Uh, and it made Germany the global leader of this supply chain for almost a decade before China has you know, su surpassed it. Um, uh, and uh, by 2010, Germany was boasting a third of global wind capacity. And by 2010, it was home to nearly half of all photovoltaic uh, installations being installed every year. Um, and again, there, there was a European uh, dimension to this uh, story uh, that's European energy market liberalization was unfolding in the 1990s and early 2000s, just as uh, the Red Green Coalition was trying to pass some of this major legislation. Um, uh, this um, was one of the big policy moves af af after Maastricht in 1992 to, to liberalize uh, Europe's electricity market. The idea was that the, the commission, specifically the competition commissioner in Brussels, wanted to create an even playing field for all energies and for electricity and natural gas in particular, and, and to prevent the favoritism of one energy or one company over another. And so the feed-in tariffs, which were the, the policy instrument that gave a political price for energy, that these ran up against what the commission thought was proper policy. And in fact, the commission uh, and others uh, uh, questioned the legality of German policy and kind of put this into legal question uh, 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 for a number of years. So Brussels, in some ways, once it finally did come around to having something akin to a common energy policy, was uh, working against what the Germans were trying to do. Uh, and this underscores one of the, the larger kind of points uh, about um, energy and European integration, that, that energy historically since 1945 has been too important often for the nation states of Europe to really give much power to the commission. And only very recently, since 2000, have they begun to do this. But even to this day, they, they retain a great amount of influence over, over national energy policy. Um, um, and you know, just 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 to underscore or to to kind of bring things to a conclusion that that the, you know it's important to remember that uh, the energy vendor and these these green policies were designed not really to fight climate change that they were designed um, not really to reduce coal use or natural gas use they they were designed you know if you read the green policy statements they were designed to create a more democratic energy system. They were de designed to help generate jobs and exports. Climate change certainly played a role, but it's not that the paramount role that we, you know, put put onto this. So, you know, some critics argue, and I think in a very justified sense, that this has only added a new green layer of energy on top of an existing very carbon intensive or methane intensive energy system that's based on lignite coal. You know, hard coal, which is a different type of coal, is phased out, but lignite coal, which is brown coal, surface mined here. Uh, uh, persists in Germany, and uh, there's the persistence of natural gas, um, and and that that is is its own problem. Um, and here I I might ask Kaya if I have time to talk about natural gas, or if you'd like me to stop here and take questions and talk about natural gas in the in the Q and A. So Stephen, I was actually just noting down that I was going to prompt you to oh. um, in a question and one of my first questions to like bring us from like the 2011 uh, critical juncture uh, or inflection yeah. point uh, of, you know, Germany going off of of nuclear and uh, kind of doubling down on its dependence on natu natural gas. And so I was going to prompt you in that direction immediately. So if you wanted to continue with visual aids there, you're welcome to. 
Sure. Oh, okay. Well, let, 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 let me say a couple things, then show a couple slides about natural gas, and then and then we'll we'll uh, break back up. Should uh, sorry do I about that. No, you can no, share. No. You can reshare. No, Wait. that's 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 fine. Um, all right. Where's... Sorry about that. Yeah. All right. So th th this is one image of kind of this kind of dense infrastructure, natural gas and and oil pipelines that Germany and Russia built together. They co-produced this uh, since the 19, really since 1969. It started very much also as a political project, um, as a part of Ostpolitik, as a way to uh, soften the Iron Curtain, uh, have West Germany kind of reach across the East. Um, uh, and and this was, um, you know, th th this infrastructure was began to be built in 69, through these tripartite deals where it was German banks and German industrial companies, uh, banks providing the credit, industrial companies providing a lot of the equipment and the technology that the Soviets lacked. And then the Soviets obviously provided the natural gas that flowed through these newly built pipelines. Um, Russia had just found these huge Siberian fields that it couldn't exploit. Um, and the oil crisis really accelerated this, uh, that some of the biggest deals came after 1973 um, and that the Germans, uh, under Helmut Schmidt, uh, and you know, into the 1980s as well, very clearly saw Russian natural gas as a more stable and predictable hydrocarbon than Middle Eastern oil, and they made this statement, you know, any number of times. Um, this codependence or co-creation uh, deepened then in the 1990s when uh, European Europe, the EU, was liberalizing its energy markets. Then Gazprom. Uh, teamed up with BASF, which is a big German chemical company, to build uh, a competing set of natural gas lines that Germany had gotten a lot of its gas from uh, the Netherlands uh, and from companies controlled by the oil majors and by Ruhrgas, and that they were charging high prices. And so Russian gas was seen as a cheaper alternative to higher priced Western gas. Uh, this is partly because there was a big gas bubble that the Russian economy had imploded and Gazprom was sitting on an immense amount of gas that nobody was consuming. And so they, they, they began to send this into Europe. And this is when Gazprom began to kind of build and take over some German infrastructure in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, uh, and, you know. But few people paid attention to the security threat um, that, that, that this this uh, argument had been made many times in the past already, you know, back in 1960, the first this is the first time the argument was trotted out by American leaders when the Germans were helping the Russians build an oil pipeline. They said, look, don't do this because you're going to rely on, you know, your your foe for, you know, for energy. Uh, the Germans actually had to leave the deal, and so they lost contracts. Their companies lost contracts to uh, other Western European uh, 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 companies. This happened again in 1982 when the biggest pipeline was built, the Yamal pipeline. There was a huge dispute between America that was saying, don't do this. You're going to uh, uh, become susceptible to energy uh, politics, and Russia's going to shut off the gas. And the Germans went ahead anyhow because jobs were at stake, and they built the pipeline. Um uh, and it, you know, this, the, the, these fears were were set again in in the 1990s. There are some gas disputes between Russia and Ukraine, and again in 2008 and 2009. And so there, there's this kind of historical memory of these, of Americans in particular, but other critics kind of laying out these fears that don't rely on Russia for your gas, uh, and they never came to fruition until 2022. And so I think that that, that there was, a, you know, an, an an argument that politicians and business leaders made that said, look, people have made this argument in the past, and and Russia has never actually shut off the tap. And in fact, they've been more reliable than the Middle East. But of course, that proved horribly wrong. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, that's uh, th this is the first pipeline that was sent to uh, build. Uh, 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 the natural gas. It was named Lud Ludmilla. It was built by Manisman. Um, here's here's Putin um, with the leader of Ruhr Gas uh, getting a ceremonial um, uh, gas meter. Um, but but also gas was sold in the 1990s as a climate bridge fuel. Uh, this is in a time when uh, uh, climate science was really focusing on carbon. Um, gas was very aggressively marketed by gas boosters, also by neoliberals, as a market-friendly, easy-to-build fuel that uh, did not, uh, you know, emit a lot of carbon. Um, it was, you know, you could build gas plants with new technology without a lot of subsidies, uh, and so it seemed to be 
to 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 be market friendly. But then since the 2020s, it's it's become known that uh, you know methane is now a huge driver of climate change. The IPCC 2021 reports that methane is responsible for 25, 30 percent of global warming. And a lot of this is leakage, right? This is this is the picture that came out in the Guardian uh, maybe a half year ago of methane leakage over Turkmenistan. That there are these you know plumes of methane just leaking into the air. Um, and the Soviet Union, Soviet network that was built in the 70s, and then the Russian network is very leaky. So a lot of kind of the the natural gas the Germans had been getting uh, isn't as green as everybody thought it was. So these these arguments began to dissolve uh, 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 in the 2010s. Um, uh, as as kind of new new climate science came on, but you know I think the security argument you know is an interesting one, and there's a lot of you know I my my focus is pre twenty pre pre two thousand, but 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 there's you know key moments after two thousand and eleven where the EU Commission uh, begins to warn against Russia, Eastern European states warning Germany against you know relying on Russia, but Merkel and her advisors and the SPD, the kind of the the traditional wing of the SPD, kind of push ahead for you know, for economic reasons and for reasons of exports. All right, so let, let me let me stop there with the slides, uh, sorry. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to take questions or as, as answer more, more pointed questions, okay? Fantastic, Stephen, thank you so much. I have to admit um, that I haven't read your book yet because it just came out, it's been the middle of semester and you know, things like that don't happen <laughs> in the middle of semester. <laughs> of course. <laughs> We're all just surviving a little bit, but um, I'm deeply uh, interested in reading it for so many reasons. There's been so many questions I've always had about a lot of this prehistory and about um, a lot of conventional wisdom around German and European energy um, policies that is deeply presentist and poorly understood. And um, I've often wondered just um, uh, if I could just have my sanity back in terms of understanding, because I've always had a sense of just how um, commercially oriented, I think that's the polite word, um, and rather than environmentally oriented, um, German um, energy policy has been, um, because that matches German policy in other areas. And also there's a very presentist uh, um, conventional wisdom that Europe and Germany has have led on things like environmental policy and um, energy policy. Whereas um, prior to the 1990s, it was the US who was really out front on these things. Um, and the Europeans would even make fun of the Americans, you know, on their on their efforts like um, the uh, ozone, the hole in the ozone. That was a source of great hilarity um, uh, in a contemporaneous way amongst uh, European scientists and industry leaders and um, politicians. I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how widespread that was. Just from what I've seen, I know that that, that was the real cleavage. And then um, uh, I'm relying on... Um, and work about like the the regulatory prowess of the United States versus the EU um, mm -hmm. over environmental policy, and then the great shift happens um, because the U.S. kind of gets the um, the Republican Revolution or takeover in 1994 of Congress. But I've never also really heard um, a, a more historic a historian's more contextualized story about why the EU does start to lead it all mm -hmm. on this stuff. Like, what's the turning point? Is it just the EU? So I have some particularly EU-focused questions because I have yeah, some yeah. EU-focused students in the room. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to push you too hard in that direction, but like half of my questions go there. And so I just am deeply curious about where that turn comes. And my my hypothesis is, and it's totally outsider um, hypothesis, but it's one that's like theoretically informed, is mm -hmm. the EU as a commission is looking for areas to lead, mm -hmm. even though they're not necessarily successful. Yeah, so that these these are great questions, and, and in fact, I'm I'm working on an article about EU energy market liberalization in the 1990s, and I see a lot of this effort in the 1990s of of the Commission trying to lead on climate change, and so that this is something where um, you know, I think you're right that that in 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 the 70s, uh, the modern environmental movement is kind of strongest in the U.S. Uh, in the 60s, really, and then and then in the 70s, um, that the e you know the, the U.S. has uh, you know helps organize Earth Day. It sets up uh, the environmental regulation system. It's it, you know even even Nixon is like kind of pro environmental regulation, um, and that there is uh, a number of things i'm not an american historian but you know that that, that happened in the 80s and the 90s one one is a uh 
kind of a shift in in the policy technique that Americans adopt that pure market based policies above all emissions trading rises to the top and becomes kind of the policy instrument that American leaders first Republicans but then even under Clinton uh you know that he he becomes much more interested in emissions trading uh the, 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 there's a policy shift that you can solve environmental problems by by creating a new market where companies trade uh, and and that this is going to reduce emissions. And this is kind of justified by the uh, 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 the solution to acid rain, the sulfur the sulfur dioxide uh, you know trading system that that, that that gets established in the 80s and the early 90s. Um, uh, the EU and 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 even George Bush. Uh, First Bush, you know, you know, runs on a quasi environmental platform that, you know, Re Reagan's deeply anti environmental, um, but 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 goes too far. And there's kind of a backlash. Uh, but but then he is confronted. Bush is confronted with this recession, you know, right, right when he goes to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. He, you know, had said kind of some very positive environmental things, but he shows up at Rio, which is this big kind of groundbreaking uh, UN organization, you know, UN meeting where they're going to hash out a framework for fighting climate change. And Bush says very clearly, like the American way of life is not up for debate. Um, and that he becomes called the Darth Vader of Rio. Uh, and, 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 and this is kind of a tipping point in American policy where the Europeans, by contrast, and the commission see themselves as not a hard power, uh, state, you know, no military, um, and that soft power and regulatory power is a place where they can exert global influence. And climate change is a new issue, is something where they can exert, you know, global influence. Uh, and, and so already in 1990, like right after the first IPCC reports come out, you see the Dutch and the French uh, and, and then the Germans get on board, like issuing statements calling for binding carbon emissions reduction goals. Uh, and, and they hope at Rio at the Earth Summit to actually have an energy tax. They, they say, we need to put a price on carbon and aggressive energy tax. And, and it fails because they can't get member state agreement. There's, you know, industry pushes back Mideastern states as well, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. I was just kind of reading the newspapers about this kind of come out and say to the EU, you know, if you do, uh, uh, you know, an energy tax, we're going to, you know, raise the price of oil and start, you know, stop exporting to you. So, so there's a lot of pushback and they keep on trying to do this and fail, uh, through, throughout the 1990s. But my, my, my sense is that there's, um, you know, there's, there's this flip that happens around 80, you know, the late eighties and early 1990s. Uh, and the single Europe act is something that kind of creates the institutional, uh, framework by which, uh, the commission is able to expand its environmental regulatory power. L Laurent Warluze, uh, a French historian, has written a lot about this, uh, and and that this gets expanded in 1992, and it gets further expanded. Um, uh, and there's some more, something else I wanted to say, but you know, if you have any follow-ups, let me let me let me think. Uh, so I guess my my uh, we have a um a um uh, some questions getting started, but I just wanted to ask. Um, I have a number of uh, other questions that I can return to, but I have yeah. one other kind of um paired, and I want to encourage people to use the Q and A. Um, I see a, another faculty member with his hand raised, and I'll invite him to be a panelist to ask the question. But I can I want to encourage others, um, any other participants or um, students from the class to use the Q and A. Um, but I will uh, um, add add a panelist um, uh, if per, per anyone's preferences. Um, but I just want to ask you one more paired question since we're on mm -hmm. the topic of European integration. Um, I was listening with great interest and ignorance about the early failures of um, European coal and steel community because um, I have to say I just haven't I you know it's something I teach it's not something I've been in the primary source documents on or anything and um, I was fascinated by early failures um, even though it makes sense to me you know I'm a as a political scientist I'm an institutionalist meaning that I study variation, the health or breadth or development, political development of institutions. And mm -hmm. so it makes sense to me that, that early crises would lead to uh, uh, failures, policy failures um, in terms of response, because these are very young institutions or it was a young institution. Um, so I'm wondering um, if you could just say anything about um, the factors or the um, kind of 
critical sets of coalitions or factors that lead to successful European integration in the energy area from what you've seen? I mean, you can go ahead and stick to your the the areas you're most familiar with um but um because i um one thing i was uh, read with great interest was your recent foreign policy article about looking at the 1973 critical juncture as one of relatively successful uh european solidarity response uh in terms of energy security so uh, like you know, just to make it very policy oriented and very presentist, I warned you that I was going to ask you to be a yeah. bad historian <laughs> and uh, and um, speak contemporaneously about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a tough question. I, I, I mean, in the seventy three uh, crisis, I, I actually see that let uh, you know that, that there is not a lot of success in um, in in forging a common you know European energy policy, and I, I actually saw a lot of. Uh, striking similarities with the, de the debates in 2022 uh, over the price uh, question about whether you should cap the price of natural gas or whether, you know, let the marginal price of natural gas determine uh, how much consumers pay. And the German, you know, kind of experts were arguing for not capping the price of gas and maybe having some subsidies, but letting marginal prices do what they will. And you see the exact same thing happening in, um, in, uh, you know, in 73, where there's actually uh, Germans rely on the Rotterdam spot market and they're able to pay a lot higher price because they can go above the cap. And so they can kind of steal or get oil from other people uh, or through 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 the Rotterdam market by paying higher prices. Um, so th there's um, to me like pr pricing policy is hugely uh, controversial. And I think that you come, you know, th there are these different traditions of pricing energy, a much more kind of national uh state-led uh, energy policy pricing, you know, in France versus a much more kind of market-oriented pricing in Germany. And so these are kind of ideological clashes that happen that have been difficult to overcome. When when, when there was successful energy policy making in the EU, it, it was with electricity market legislation by, by or, or sorry, liberalization. And when, when I say successful, I mean, um, the EU got it passed, not not necessarily that it was good legislation, but, but that they got it passed. Uh, but it took a horribly long time. Uh, it was, you know, the first green paper about electricity market liberalization and came out in 1988. And it wasn't until 96 and 98 that they passed the first directives. And even those were watered down. And it wasn't until the early 2000s. So you're really talking about a whole decade and a half or almost two decades of kind of uh, the commission pushing ahead. Um Encountering resistance at first from from um, uh, Germany and France, having to revise its models and and then incorporate basically two different models for how you liberalize uh, the electricity sector or the gas sector. One is the French idea, and one is basically the German idea. Uh, and so that's an example of them trying them meaning the Commission having to kind of bridge these national differences and change tack and and accept multiple possible outcomes instead of the one possible liberalization outcome that they wanted. The French were arguing, you know, we, we need a single buyer model where we have a single uh, neutral buyer who kind of controls the network, but then you can have different suppliers and different kind of people in distribution. And the Germans were saying, no, we need to totally break everything up. And eventually the commission says, well, we're going to have to do both to get you both on board. And so th this is this is kind of how it plays out that there's this kind of back and forth. Um, and I think that, you know, there, there were failed attempts in 92 and kind of strong uh, uh, DG Energy uh, and DG Comp um, kind of tried too aggressively to roll things out and got pushed back right away. And so it was and and, and then they had to go back to the drawing board and work with uh, uh uh, the economics ministry in Germany and the equivalent in France to really kind of co-design these proposals that then finally, you know, pass at the European level. So there, there's, I mean, I don't know how to, put, how to put that in a sophisticated way, but there's a lot of back and forth. It takes a long time. Um, and, and there's no, uh, like, it's not like you have a policy that then gets rolled out, but, but it, you know, it, it, it gets watered down a lot. And then I think that's, you know, it's part of the problem. Right. So, um, a lot of unanticipated that. results time, as well. Oh, time would probably be like the critical factor in, in your theorizing, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry, I, I, I misspoke about about uh, critical juncture as in like um, comparable, comparable. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes. Very comparable. Like I was, yeah. I was 
I was like, oh, this is like exactly what happened in 1973. These the same the same riffs, the same debate over marginal versus marginal pricing versus uh, you know ceiling on on energy prices. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps without as much existential threat, I suppose. Um, maybe I don't know. I'm just trying to be like the political scientist in the chat and theorizing the difference between the two cases in a way. Um, I would say more in 1973. I mean, you know, you, you read the newspapers that were coming out of Germany and it, it was, you know, our way of life is going to end. Uh, our our energy intensive society is going to grind to a halt. Uh, the, 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 this is a shock that they hadn't had since 1945, that this kind of fourfold rise in the price of oil and 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 that kind of excessive rhetoric kind of diminishes after about four or five months but the there, there were three or four months when everybody was like oh my gosh this is this is going to kind of stop the western european you know economic model in its tracks and we're going to have to redesign everything so there is a lot of you know well, there were actually greater material effects um because yeah. the 2022 was more of a hypothetical worst case scenario have to act have to prevent it yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I have more questions, but I'm going to um, welcome um, David Demerit. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm David Demerit. I'm a geographer. I work in earth and environment at BU. Um, and I wondered, I was wondered if you could step back a little. You're, I know your your thing is Germany, but kind of step back a little bit and put the German story in the context both of kind of other national European energy transition stories. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of Britain uh fire the miners dash for gas north sea balance of payments kind of you know like yeah uh candles and electricity uh, you know power outages rationing in the 70s like repeatedly um or france so mm -hmm. as it were those are kind of nationally contained stories um but then another one might be about like the euro dollar market in london the kind of emergence of all of this massive d offshore dollar accounts, largely as I understand it, you know, kind of Soviet money from selling oil, but pre-gas, you know, so selling petrol uh, to Western Europe, and then parking that money in London, which, you know, becomes butler to the world. Um, and so that's kind of quite a different story because that's about integration, whereas, you know, your kind of story is about, you know, kind of transnational integration, the euro dollars. And whereas your story is in some sense about a, a, a moment in time of a nationally contained German economy mm -hmm. uh, and it's buffeting in various ways. Um increasingly you know kind of integrated um and yeah just like how the german story looks vis-a-vis -vis like the french or the british yeah yeah well the uh, you know the let's see the british story is very interesting that they have you know this north sea oil and gas which gives their experience of the 1980s and 1990s a very kind of different uh inflection you know, at one point, I think in the late 80s or early 90s, Britain becomes the fourth or fifth largest hydrocarbon exporter uh, because North Sea oil and gas. Yeah, is so certainly uh, pays and, the bills. <laughs> yeah. And, and so Giuliano Garabini has a great article about this and, and, and looks at how Thatcher kind of explicitly tried to push push natural gas as a way to kind of break the mining industry uh, in the mid 1980s. Uh, and, and that this was, you know, that she promoted these combined uh power plants that could switch from gas to coal and back and forth um and and so that that you know that that energy is politicized in its own sense in england um they then you know the british story looks different in the sense that they phase out coal you know it you know uh in a way that the germans don't phase out lignite coal uh that you know the british have this access to natural gas they put a lot of money as you said in the dash to gas this is uh with, with the arrival of new technology the combined cycle gas turbine which allows for kind of fairly cheap gas plants low costs uh and and that this is what helps eliminate the coal industry uh in in britain in the 1990s and early 2000s um, although it's all you know it's already and it's on the ropes in the 60s 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you know, the kind of number of pits are getting closed, kind of the rise of nuclear power. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to what extent is that a function of, you know, kind of weakly entrenched corporatism and the kind of hold of the unions on the SDP, which means that, no, sorry, mate, we're not having it. Mm-hmm. And how does that look versus the French story where, you know, kind of crudely understand it, kind of nuclear, you know, French love nothing better than a grand projet and, um, you know, national glory and yeah, is a kind of quite a, yeah. So if the Germans are afraid that nuclear is a route to a strong state, the French are grabbing that with both hands. Um, yeah. So there, there, there is, you know, there's, there's, uh, Gabriella Hecht has, has written this, this book, the radiance of France. It's about yeah. the, the, you know, the nuclear power industry and nuclear power gets wedded to kind of prestige, uh, under de Gaulle and other, other kind of, you know, it's France's way to become a third power you know, a nuclear power, uh, part, part, part of the, the French story of, of why they persist into nuclear power in the 1970s, you know, both France and West Germany have these very big nuclear plans uh, uh, in the early 1970s. The Germans get stalled, the French don't. And part of this is institutional structure that France has EDF, which is one big yeah. electricity company that has a lot of political weight. Uh, it's very close to the political parties, that, you know, a lot of uh, people kind of come through EDF from uh, the Grande Ecole and then go back to government. Um, Germans have local courts, which is where they they stop the reactor building that the anti-nuclear movement is able to kind of um, prevent nuclear power building through through the local courts, which is what the, you know puts the effective moratorium. So there's there, there's these two big uh, kind of di- disjunctures plus different ideologies attached to it. So I think there's a lot going on, but there's an article waiting to be written about kind of a comparative approach to why France persists and Germany doesn't because the anti-nuclear movement was very transnational. People in Baden-Württemberg were going across, uh, you know, uh, the Rhine, uh, going into France and organizing there and vice versa. So there, there, there is kind of mobilization on both sides. Um, in terms of the euro dollar market, um, you know, initially, uh, Helmut Schmidt is not as concerned about the euro, uh, about the oil shocks in the case of the German economy, because he basically says uh, in behind closed doors, like we we can't afford to pay hard currency because we have a balance of pound balance of payments uh, surplus. So we, among the European states, are, a- are are going to be able to weather this this higher price of oil, but other states are not. And this is going to cause, you know, balance of payment crises and ultimately a recession. So at first, he's he's kind of uh, not sure uh, how this is going to play out, not concerned for Germany, but concerned for the indirect effects that if, if other countries have to pay so much more hard currency, it's going to lead them to spiral into recession. And then Germany won't be able to export as much to them. But the euro dollar market, I, I mean, it's it's a uh, uh it's it's an interesting thing that ends up being connected to the decline of communism fritz martel has written uh a great book on this called the triumph of broken promises and 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 he shows how you know it's these petrodollars it's not just the soviet union but it's also uh opec producing states recycle this money through london but also through a lot of western european banks in frankfurt uh and the benelux countries a lot of this then gets loaned back to eastern european states that use it to purchase you know consumer goods uh and 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 this this is part of the story that this kind of uh subterranean financial story that he tells about how eastern europe becomes indebted a lot of that is that western european banks are look are flushed with money and saying where can we loan latin american the debt thing implodes in the 80s and so they start ending you know you know loaning this this the you know the, these excess petrodollars to eastern europe i i haven't done the archival work so i you know i i but that's that that's his argument um yeah but th- there is uh, i mean there's we 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 still don't have like a great comparative european energy history uh story yet for the 80s 90s and the early 2000s but i think these are these are great great national kind of points of comparison Stephen. Yeah. These questions, this conversation. Um, uh, so, I, I apologize that I'm not asking more uh, incisive questions about your findings, but I completely it makes it perfect into an intuitive sense to me that, that a lot of this comes down to domestic electoral politics and domestic social movements, domestic political structures, um, and that a lot of the causal, especially comparative causal dynamics, lie in in that level. But while you were talking, and especially while you had the map up about the um, 
about the energy pipelines or the natural gas pipelines, and then especially um, in relationship to uh, David's David's great questions about about um, some of the other contemporaneous and some of the other comparative European stories, either of anti nuclear movements, um, it was making me think about some of the conversations I was hearing this summer in policy conversations in like Spain and Italy, talking about um, exploiting is a strong word, but that's my analytical lens, uh, talking about exploiting um, uh, close relationships with former colonial holdings in terms of places to um, uh, shift um, and substitute reliance on energy and other and other energy suppliers in pla from places like Algeria, Morocco, mm -hmm. uh, Libya, et cetera. Um, and um, I was thinking about how a lot of uh, interesting um, conversations in history, I'm not in history, but I'm, I pick up on little uh, things that come out of it, is about um, the conversation about Germany's lack or, or Germany's um, short experience as a colonial power. And I'm wondering if in any of your research, any of the story, I know that's the prehistory of the story perhaps, uh, but if any if any German politicians at any point in the 1960s or 1970s said, darn, if we'd only had colonial holdings <laughs> like the other well, European states. This is so this manifests in the lack of a major German oil company. So a major. Right. So um, that uh, America, they're, they're the seven sisters. And then if you can't count uh, a company Francaise uh, to petrol um, CFP, uh, which gets going in the 20s uh that, that they're really eight so france has one the netherlands has one italy develops um eni as a way to kind of have have a major uh britain has shell uh and uh well shells shells a joint company but but bp and america has has five of these companies and and they're hugely powerful and they're very much a colonial legacy or kind of a neo-colonial legacy and germany there's a whole backstory to this. The Germans in the Berlin to Baghdad railway, uh, you know, found, got the rights to oil concessions on like 50 or hundred miles either side of where they were going to build um, in the, this railway that would have gone, uh, you know, the whole way to Baghdad. Right. So they would have, and, and, and they knew that Mosul was going to be a major source of oil. Uh, they get kicked out of the uh, Turkish petroleum company, uh, which had given them rights after World War One, right? So they lose their rights to the to the Turkish petroleum company. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to go into too much detail here, but it's an interesting story. But then the Ottoman Empire implodes after World War One. Big debate: Are the, is this Turkish petroleum company legal? You know, you, it, the Ottomans had granted these rights on the eve of World War One. The Ottoman Empire ceases to exist. The Americans say no because they're not in in this. But the British. And the French get in and, and the Dutch are in, say yes. And and so there's a big debate in the 20s. And eventually the Germans never get into this agreement. The Americans do get into this agreement. And so they get rights. French, the British, the Americans and the Dutch get, get rights to uh, oil in the former Ottoman Empire, right, which is the big oil field of the world. Um, the Germans, again, during World War II, you know, try and create their own oil company um i forget what it's called uh, the deutsche bank is involved but uh you know the nazis create their own uh, oil company that's separate from ig farben which is you know trying to synthesize oil and again obviously that that that, that fails so so you know a, as a result they're left without a major and they're hugely concerned with this in the 60s and the 70s and they very much try to build their own major beginning in 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 the mid 1960s and they throw a lot of money at this company called consortium called demonex which basically brings together Weber, which is one of the big energy companies. Uh, they have Gelsenberg, which has some minimal oil holdings in Libya, but 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 it never takes off. There's never enough money, you know. And 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 so that is part of the story that the Germans don't have this tool to get uh, to to uh, get oil. Um, it turns out not to be a very useful tool after 1973. It's, it's more of a hope for tool that doesn't actually work out very well in 73. Um, but then there's an interesting story about pipeline politics uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s that hinge around natural gas and the fields of the Caucasus, where uh, this you know new uh, or the Caspian you know Azerbaijan. Uh, uh, you know, finds new fields, I think in 89. Um, and there's kind of a scramble for them to get access to them. And there's a whole kind of set of pipeline politics around the Nabucco pipeline, which ultimately fails. Um, 
but 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 th but but this was promoted by the EU uh, in the early 2000s as a way to overcome Russian energy dependence, uh, and and they can never put it together. Uh, so that's another kind of uh, example of where where there's kind of this this uh, transnational geopolitics. The implosion of Soviet power creates this vacuum, uh, and some EU leaders try and scramble to get in, but you know, but it never pans out. Um, Thank you, Stephen. That, that that was really. Um, are, are some of those details in your book um, about the about the envy about uh, of German mid century yeah makers? Yeah, they 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 look to Italy. That they say, well, well, Italy did it under Enrico Mattei, who helped form ENI. He dies in this mysterious plane crash, uh, and and they're like, they they did, you know, the 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 Italians managed to build an energy company, and we we need to do the same. Um, Helmut Schmidt gets behind it, but it, it just doesn't go anywhere. I think that's fascinating. I think it could probably explain a lot. I mean, I wouldn't want to overdetermine it, but it could uh -huh. explain a lot about um, some delayed reactions on the part of German uh, politicians that maybe aren't necessarily commercial, but are, um, you know, ontological security oriented, as in we're so weak vis-a-vis -vis other European powers on this area, and we can kind of get away with a bad policy for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> a bad policy in a different way, differently bad. <laughs> Well, we are actually at our time um, where, oh, okay. uh, you know, the, the the event is at the end. But thank you so much for such an informative and excellent and, and timely project. And um, we really benefited from your from your lecture and your value added. And the um, I love a historian's talk with all the pictures and all the all the all the historical documents and everything. I even though I'm not a historian, yeah. I attend. Every well, we're not as conceptual as, as, as you political scientists, but we, uh, you know, we love the details. So. Exactly. And I really enjoy the details. I think if I did it over again, I'd be, um, you know, in your camp. But uh, <laughs> this is this is excellent work and it couldn't be more timely because these are the kind of things like political scientists look for puzzles. And this space is filled with puzzles, at least in a conceptual sense, like about German behavior, about, uh, you know, a, a failed or delayed European policy and about a lot of um, contradictory kinds of interests and and. Um, and pressures. So this is this is excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, David.